So welcome back to Basil's Physics Classroom. Okay. So today we are going to learn about the chapter Kinetic Theory of Gases. Right. Similar to the previous chapters, this will be again a brief description of the chapter. So talking about kinetic theory of gases, I should tell you some of the properties of gases. So first point you have to remember when you talk about gas is that the intermolecular force of attraction between the gas molecules is minimum. And because of that fact, they can expand indefinitely and they can also be compressed. And there is no specific shape or size also, right? Now, before we move into kinetic theory in detail, you have to take some basic assumptions about kinetic theory. Then only we can proceed further, okay? So please do remember that kinetic theory actually helps us in relating some macroscopic properties like pressure, volume, etc. with the microscopic properties like momentum, kinetic energy, speed and everything, okay? So let's move on to the basic assumptions to be taken. And in fact, there are a lot of assumptions there. So I can teach you a small shortcut for that. You can just remember this word, Dave, PP, NTR. What is it? Dave, PP, NTR. NTR, just remember MGR. All right. So Dave, PP, NTR. Let me tell you what this. D corresponds to density. Now, when you take a gas molecule inside a container, the density will be constant at every point inside the container. That's the first point. The next letter is A. A is actually indicative of both attraction and repulsion. Okay. So the attractive or the repulsive forces among the gas molecules is minimum. And also remember that since the mass of the gas molecule and the speed is very high, the gravitational force of attraction is also not take into consideration okay now the third one is v for velocity when the gas molecules are moving inside a container they will be moving with a wide range of velocity starting from zero to infinity and during the random motion r for random and during the random motion they will be colliding with each other and with the walls of the container remember that the collision will be perfectly elastic in nature e for elastic okay and during this elastic collision what happens is there will be a change in the momentum p for the change in momentum and since there is a change in the momentum there will be a force exerted and hence there will be a pressure imparted onto the walls of the container so p for pressure and remember that the number of collisions per unit volume is always remaining a constant. Okay, we are actually assuming that the number of collisions per unit volume is a constant and also the time during a collision is negligible compared to the time between two successive collisions. Okay, so remember this term day PP and DR and you can have all the assumptions uh, in your fingertips. All right. And one more thing, remember the basic things like they are identical, they are spherical and everything. Okay. So that's about the assumptions, the basic assumptions we have to learn in kinetic theory of gases. Okay. So having learned that, let's move on to the gas laws. Okay. So the first gas law that I'm going to teach you about is the first one, none other than Boyle's law. So based on Boyle's law, we can say that at constant temperature, I repeat, at constant temperature pressure is inversely proportional to volume pressure is inversely proportional to volume or we can write it like this p1 v1 is equal to p2 v2 or we know that volume is mass by density right so we can also write it like p1 by rho1 is equal to p2 by rho2 all right or we can also write it like this p1 by n1 is equal to P2 by N2. Here N1 and N2 corresponds to the number of molecules per unit volume. N1 and N2 corresponds to the number of molecules per unit volume. Okay. Now, that is the first law, Boyle's law. So, please make sure that you watch till the end of the video because the graphical part and everything I will be discussing towards the end. Okay. Now, the second law is about Charles' law. Now, based on Charles' law, we can say that 
at constant at constant tell me at constant yes at constant pressure v is directly proportional to the temperature or we can write v1 by t1 is equal to v2 by t2 or in terms of density if you write it you can write like this rho t or rho 1 t1 is equal to rho 2 t2 fine okay and one more thing worth remembering when you learn about charles law is actually the charles law for centigrade scale for every one degree celsius rise or fall in temperature the corresponding volume the corresponding volume will increase or decrease by a factor of 1 by 273.15 okay so we can actually write it like vt is equal to v naught into 1 plus 1 by 273.15 t okay so do remember this equation and the charles law for centigrade scale also clear so let's move on to the next one and the third one and that is gale's class law so based on this law we can say that it is also known as pressure law okay now based on this law we can say that at constant volume at constant volume the pressure is directly proportional to the temperature or we can write like p1 by t1 is equal to p2 by t2 right p1 by t1 is equal to p2 by t2 and one more thing you have to remember here is the uh, Gale-Lewis law for centigrade scale or the pressure law for centigrade scale and that is explained similar to the previous one for every one degree celsius rise or fall in temperature for every one degree celsius rise or fall in temperature the pressure changes by a factor of 1 by 273.15 or you can simply write it as pt at the temperature t is equal to p0 the pressure at 0 degree celsius into 1 plus 1 by 273.15 t okay that was the third law gale law law the pressure law clear moving on to the fourth one and that is avogadro's law fourth one is avogadro's law now based on this law what it says is that equal volumes equal volumes of two gases under similar conditions of temperature and pressure will contain equal number of molecules i hope it is clear equal volume of gas, two gases under similar conditions of temperature and pressure will contain equal number of molecules clear right and the next one it is graham's law of diffusion suppose you are taking two gases under the same conditions of temperature and pressure again which are allowed it to diffuse into each other diffuse with each other then based on Graham's law for diffusion we can say that the rate of diffusion will be proportional to 1 by root rho rho is the density or we can write r1 by r2 will be equal to root of rho 2 by rho 1 or this will be in turn equal to m2 by m1 or we can also write r is equal to volume by t the time okay r is proportion to 1 by root rho okay and now the next law and that is dalton's law of partial pressure dalton's law now suppose we are taking a, a mixture of non-reacting gases together if you are taking a mixture of non-reacting gases together each exerting a pressure p1 p2 etc okay so suppose we are taking them together means what will happen they will be exerting a total pressure pt will which will be equal to p1 plus p2 plus p3 plus etc to pn so according to dalton's law of partial pressures what it says is that the total pressure exerted by a mixture of non-reacting gases will be equal to the pressure exerted the individual pressure exerted okay so based on this idea let's move on to the ideal gas equation so using our Boyle's law and charles law uh, we have framed the ideal gas equation which is pv is equal to nrt which is our ideal gas equation i'm very sure that this is very familiar to each and every one of you now what are the different forms in which this can be expressed one form pv is equal to n we can actually write it as 
small m by capital M into RT. Small m is a given mass, capital M is a smaller mass, R universal gas constant, T the temperature, right? Or in another way, it can be expressed like this PV is equal to N, N by NART, N by NART, what is N? The number of molecules, NA is the Avogadro's number, 6.023 in when raised to 23, R, the universal gas constant again, T is the temperature. Now, R by NA is actually equal to something else, which is known as KB, or we can just put it as K, no problem. So KB is known as the Boltzmann's constant. KB is known as the Boltzmann's constant. Okay, so we have PV is equal to NRT. We have PV is equal to N by M and RT. PV is equal to N, KBT. Make sure you remember these equations. It will come in handy in the next session. Okay, now a little bit of correction to this equation to get the real gas equation. And this uh, state equation for a real gas is given by Van der Waals equation, or we can call it as Van der Waals gas equation. And according to the equation, we can write like this P plus mu square. Instead of n, I'm using mu here, okay? Don't get confused. So mu square it is uh, again the number of moles by V square into A into V minus mu B is equal to mu RT. Or you can use n here, no problem, right? So here, mu number of moles, a and b are constants. Okay, so Vanter will actually apply the correction factor to the ideal gas equation to write the equation for the real gases. Okay, and you know that real gases actually does not obey all the gas laws and everything, so it's a deviation from the ideal behavior. Clear? Right. Now let's move on to learn about the kinetic theory of an ideal gas and about the pressure of an ideal gas. Okay. For learning about the pressure of an ideal gas, let me consider a cubical volume. Okay, a cubical volume I'm considering. Um, and the side length of the cube is L. Okay, inside the cube, gas molecules are present and they are in random motion. Okay, and please remember that the gas is actually isotropic, which means there is no preferred direction for the uh, velocities of the gas molecules. So by symmetry, we can say that three axes I have considered here. So there must be a velocity in the x direction, y direction, and z direction. And by symmetry, we can write vx is equal to vy is equal to vz. Okay, right? So now, if I want to define the instantaneous velocity, if I want to define the instantaneous velocity, I can write like this. v will be equal to vx i cap plus vy j cap plus V is a K cap. Or you can also write this as V is equal to V X square plus V Y square plus V Z square within roots. Okay. So taking the square root on both sides, what do we get? We get the mean velocity V square. We get the mean velocity V square is actually equal to, I have already told you that V X is approximately, V Y is approximately equal to V Z. So this is actually equal to 3 Vx square or you can write the mean Vx square value is equal to the mean square value by 3. Okay. Now please remember this condition that you will need later on. Okay. So now we have found out what is the instantaneous velocity for the gas molecule inside the cubical container. Now let me define a term here known as tau, the relaxation time. Okay, relaxation time means it is a time between two successive collisions. Okay, now if I am defining the time between two successive collisions with the walls of the container, then I can write here at here class time t should be equal to time t is the time between two successive collisions between the walls of the container. Then I can write t is equal to the distance by velocity, so 2l by vs, right. I can also define the frequency as the reciprocal of time, so that will be Vx by 2L, right? So since we have the time, we can also define the change in momentum. We know that a change in momentum is actually equal to final momentum minus the initial momentum, right? So we can write it as final, the gas molecule is coming and hitting on this wall and going back. I told you that the collision is perfectly 
elastic one of our basic assumptions so there is no change in the velocity if it is hitting with the velocity vx it will be returning with the velocity vx but the direction will be opposite so if this direction is positive the returning direction will be negative so we can say that the change in momentum of a gas molecule is given by minus final minus mvx minus initial mvx well, that is equal to minus 2mvx or the change in momentum of the wall can be written as 2mvx since the momentum is conserved over there okay now we have got the change in momentum now how do you determine the force we know that force is equal to change in momentum by time in loss of motion we are learned about impulse right f delta t or ft is equal to the change in momentum so from here force is equal to delta p by t or that is equal to 2m vx divided by what is t 2l by vx right so 2l by vx so what do you get from there let's substitute let's simplify that and find f is equal to 2 and 2 gets cancelled so you'll be getting m vx square divided by l okay Taking total force into account there, we can write it as m by l into summation or we can simply write it as vx1 square plus vx2 square because there are n number of molecules there plus x to total vxn square or this can be in turn written as m by l n vx square right now tell me what is vx square equal to the mean square by 3 right so this can be substituted here so we'll be getting 1 by 3 m by l n v mean square all right now this is a force actually now how do you write the pressure based on this we know that pressure is equal to force by area right pressure is equal to force by area therefore we can write pressure the total pressure pt or simply you can write p is equal to the force ft by the area or that is equal to 1 by 3 m a l n v mean square all right so now what is area into length area into length is actually the volume so you can write this as 1 by 3 m by v n v mean square okay now m by v n v mean square so the pressure is equal to very important to remember 1 by 3 m n v mean square by v or this v mean we can actually write it as the v r m is also right now here i'm going to do a small manipulation here what i'm going to do is i'm going to multiply in the numerator and denominator with 2 all right so what is the manipulation i'm going to multiply in the numerator and denominator with the 2 so let's see what you get p is equal to 2 by 3 okay half we also am writing it over here uh, i'll just write it over here v m n what is m m is the mass of each molecule n is the total number of molecules so m into n is actually the total mass right so we can write m n which is the total mass into v mean square or half m v square what is half m v square that is a kinetic energy so we can write pv is equal to 2 by 3 into the kinetic energy or again write kinetic energy is equal to 3 by 2 pv right and what is pv equal to nrt so this is equal to 3 by 2 nrt right or you can write this as 3 by 2 kb and kpt the kinetic energy so remember all these equations that is why i actually showed you how we are getting this equation very very important okay now we know that they are moving randomly right so they have a kinetic energy and they are actually moving randomly and we actually define three types of velocities over there three types of velocity one the rms velocity two the most probable velocity and three the average velocity so the first one vrms now the root mean square velocity or vrms is given by root of 
v1 square plus v2 square plus etc. del vn square divided by n, where n corresponds to the number of molecules, the total number of molecules. Okay, this can also be written as vrms is equal to root of 3p by rho, root of 3p by rho. Now, one thing you have to remember here is at constant temperature, the pressure and density both increases. Which means, at constant temperature, VRMS will be independent of the pressure or the density. Okay, since both are increasing at the same rate. Right, so this is equal to root of 3RT by M or which is equal to root of 3PV by M or this is equal to root of 3 kvt by small m. Small m is a given mass, capital M is a molar mass. Okay, so that is the RMS velocity or like I mentioned previously, V RMS square is also equal to V mean square. Okay, so this V square we had in the equation for pressure that is actually the RMS velocity or the V square RMS. Okay, so now that was RMS velocity. Now the next one is the most probable velocity. As the term indicates, the most probable velocity is the velocity most of the gas molecules possesses. Okay, so what is the most probable velocity? It is given by Vmp is equal to root 2 p by rho or equal to 2 rt by m or is equal to 2 root of kbt by m. Okay. As you can see, there is a high degree of similarity between the two equations. The only change is in the constant 3 over here, right? It becomes 2 here. And now the third one, that is the average speed. The V average is given by V average is equal to V average is equal to V1 plus V2 plus etc. till Vn divided by M. It is a dot number of molecules, okay? And now another way in which we can express this is V average is equal to root of 8 by pi RT by M or P by O. Or this is equal to root of 8 by pi KBT by M or PV by M is also another way. Alright. So remember all these equations corresponding to the three more velocities that a gas molecule can have. The RMS velocity, the most probable velocity and the average velocity. Okay. Now one more thing that is about Maxwell's distribution. Now based on Maxwell's distribution, Maxwell's distribution actually gives us an idea about the number of molecules possessing a certain velocity. So the distribution curve is actually like this. In the y-axis is dn by dv, okay, and in the x-axis it is actually the velocity, okay. Now dn by dv is the number of molecules at a particular speed, alright. So now here we will have the most probable Vmp which is the most probable speed and then we have the average speed, V average, then we will have the RMS speed. Okay, so uh, this along the x-axis we are actually marking the velocities. So first comes most probable speed, that is the peak of the curve and then V average and then V RMS. And please do remember that V RMS is actually greater than V average which is greater than V most probable. Okay, so please remember this condition V RMS greater than V average greater than V most probable. Okay, and one more thing worth remembering that is when the temperatures increase, when the temperature is increase, the Maxwell's distribution curve actually shifts towards the right. It shifts towards the right and also becomes broader. So if this is temperature T1 and this is temperature T2, then T2 will be greater than T1. Okay, at higher temperature, the Maxwell's distribution curve will shift towards the right and it becomes broader. Okay, clear? Any doubts there? I hope not. Okay, so that's about Maxwell's distribution curve, which gives you, how, tells you how the velocities are distributed. Now, another term that you have to remember there is about uh, the mean free path, lambda. So, mean free path, lambda. Now, mean free path lambda is given by 1 by root 2 pi d square n. Okay. Now, please do remember that d corresponds to the diameter of the gas molecule. Lambda, what is actually mean free path? 
mean by mean free path we mean it is a straight line path travel between two successive collision it is a straight line path travel between two successive collision and lambda is given by 1 by root 2 pi d square m okay now this can also be written like this this is also equal to 1 by root 2 pi d square m by rho that's another form of representing that okay and in another way we can represent like 1 by root 2 pi d square kt by p okay that's another form of representing the mean free bar so please remember that n is the number of molecules per unit volume and uh, d is the diameter of the molecule Okay, so what is the mean free path? It is a distance, straight line distance travel between two successive collisions. Okay, clear any doubts over there? Okay, if you have any doubts, please do feel free to comment below. I'll uh, get back to you as soon as possible. Okay, all right. So let's move on to the next one, and that is about the degrees of freedom. Now, degrees of freedom refer to the independent ways in which a gas molecule can move. The number of independent ways in which a gas molecule can move. Now there are three possible ways in which a gas molecule can move. It can be a translational motion, it can be a rotational motion, or it can be a vibrational motion at high temperatures. Right? Now, to determine the degrees of freedom, we have a simple equation like this. F is equal to 3n minus i, where n corresponds to the number of atoms there, and i, the number of independent restrictions. Or we can also know, call it as the number of constraint relations. Okay. Now let me tell you how to apply this formula. Suppose we are having a monoatomic gas. Suppose I'm taking oxygen, monoatomic O I'm taking. Right. Now, this O I'm taking. So F will be what? If it is monoatomic means F will be equal to 3 into N. How many atoms are there? Only one. Minus I. Is there any other atom here? Only one atom there, right? It is monoatomic. So there is no independent restrictions and that will be taken as zero. So this is equal to three. Clear? Now suppose it is O2 I'm taking. O2. Now the degrees of freedom will be equal to three into how many number of atoms are there? One, two. And as you can see, there is an independent restriction to the movement. And this restriction, this there is only one restriction and I take it as one. So this is 5 minus 6 minus 1, that is 5. Understood? So we are not actually counting the number of bonds. We are not ta uh, taking care of the fact that whether it's a double bond or a triple bond or something like that. We are just considering the independent restriction between them. So it will be fine. Now, please do remember that for a monoatomic gas, the three degrees of freedom, there will only be a translational motion possible there for them. They can either move in the x-axis, y-axis, or z-axis, okay? And for a diatomic gas, there are actually three translational degrees of freedom and two rotational degrees of freedom, okay? It can actually rotate only among two other axes. Along one axis, the moment of inertia will be minimum. So don't actually worry about the moment of inertia terms right now. I will be dealing that in detail in another video, okay? Just for the time being, remember that when f is equal to 5, there will be three translational degrees of freedom and two rotational degrees of freedom. And if you are considering, and if you are considering a triatomic molecule, I am actually doing a, a, the linear triatomic molecule, yeah. So for a linear triatomic molecule, what will be the degrees of freedom? Tell me, F is equal to 3 into 1, 2, 3. Number of relations, 1, 2. So that will be 9 minus 2 will be 7. And if it is a triatomic molecule, non-linear triatomic molecule, what will be F? F will be 3 into 3. Number of constant relation will be 1, 2, 3. So minus 3, that will be 6. And of those six, three will be translation degrees of freedom and the other three will be rotational degrees of freedom. Okay? I hope the point is clear. Right. So one more thing you have to remember here is when you refer to vibrational modes or vibration degrees of freedom, uh, there are actually two types. One due to the kinetic and the other due to the potential. Okay? So do remember that also. Then. Okay. So that is about degrees of freedom. Okay. Now, what you have to remember is about the law of equipartition of energy. What is it? Law of equipartition of energy. 
Now, according to the law, what it says is that for a system in thermal equilibrium, I repeat, for a system in thermal equilibrium, its total energy will be distributed in each of its degrees of freedom. Okay, which means I can write it like this. Kinetic energy for degrees of freedom will be equal to 1 by 2 kVt or the kinetic energy, the total kinetic energy will be corresponding to F by 2 kVt. The kinetic energy will be corresponding to F by 2 kVt, right? So based on the law of equipartition of energy, we can say that for a system at the equilibrium, for a system at equilibrium, its total energy will be distributed among its various degrees of freedom, okay? Another point which I have already learned in thermodynamics, I am just citing it over here again. One, it is about CV. What is CV? Tell me. Specificated constant volume. Do remember that delta U is equal to NCV delta D. That is when a process is done at constant volume, the entire heat given will be used to increase the internal energy. Okay. And another term here is CP. What is CP? Now, Cp is the specificated constant pressure and when the process is performed at constant pressure, the heat given will be used for two purposes. One, to increase the temperature and two, to increase the internal energy. That's why we can write like this. Delta Qp will be equal to the work done plus the delta U factor. This is actually our first law of thermodynamics, right? So, delta W. What is delta W? N R delta T plus what is delta U? N C V delta T, right? Now, what is delta Q P? What is delta Q P? It is N C P delta T, fine. Now, substituting this and taking uh, the C V term over here, we can write N in, uh, into delta T, C P minus C V is equal to N R delta T. And now uh, N delta D, N delta D gets cancelled out. So we have Cp minus Cv is equal to R and this is known as Mayer's formula. Okay, so please do remember this condition also there. I'm sure that you already are familiar with this equation. But please, I'm just highlighting it again. Because questions will be coming, the kinetic theory questions will not come along. It will be coming in combination with thermodynamics. Okay, so remember about Cv, Cp and also Mayer's formula. Okay, now let's move on to some additional conditions here. And the first point is, this is something I think you already know, but we have to remember this. So I'm discussing it again. Cp is equal to gamma by gamma minus 1 into R. So what is gamma actually? You have learned in thermodynamics, gamma is the adiabatic constant. So gamma is equal to Cp by Cv. And what is gamma? Another form we can write gamma is equal to 1 plus 2 by F where F corresponds to the degrees of freedom, okay? And Cv corresponds to R by gamma minus 1, which is also equal to F by 2R. Now here Cp can also be written in terms of F as F by 2 plus 1 into R, okay? Now here, I've written the gamma value for a monoatomic, diatomic and triatomic, okay? So if you can remember these values, it will be well and good. So instead of using this formula during the examination time, you can actually remember these values if it is not given in the question, okay? Now, another situation is of that of a gaseous mixture. Suppose in a given volume V, two non-reactive gases uh, having mu1 and mu2 number of moles are enclosed. Okay. Then the resultant mole fraction will be equal to mu1 plus mu2. And the resulting molecular weight of the gas will be equal to mu1 m1 plus mu2 m2 divided by m1 plus, sorry, mu1 plus mu2 and Cv. Cv is actually the specific heated constant volume for the mixture, okay? So Cv will be equal to mu1, Cv1 for the first gas, mu2, Cv2 for the second gas, divided by mu1 plus mu2. Similarly, you can write Cp, mu1, Cp1 plus mu2, Cp2 divided by mu1 plus P2. Similarly, gamma will be, what is gamma? Cp by Cv, right? Here, Cp mixture by Cv mixture, or you'll be getting it as when you're taking the ratio of this, mu1 cp1 plus mu2 cp2 divided by mu1 cv1 plus mu2 cv2 okay and moving on to the next one when a container is moving with a certain speed v is suddenly stopped you know what will happen 
When a container moving with the speed v is suddenly stopped, the heat or the temperature of the gas increases. Or we can say that the internal energy of the gas inside the container increases. That is why when some accidents and everything occur, uh, when um, uh, a lorry or something having a certain gas container collides or gets into an accident, there are high chances of an explosion. Why? Because the internal energy of the gases gets increased there. Okay. So we can write half mv square is equal to r by gamma minus 1 into delta d, where gamma is a adiabatic constant. Okay. Now, another point to remember here is the VRMS value, which can be related with the velocity of sound. So VRMS is equal to root of 3 by gamma into Vs, okay? And another condition is the ratio of VRMS to V average to VMP. <clears throat> and that is given by root 3 is to root 2.5 is to root 2. Now this individually we have learned the equations. Here we are just comparing and writing the ratio. And the next point, the average distance between the gas molecule at normal temperature and pressure will be... 10 raised to minus 9 meters, okay? And the eighth point, if we are considering a polyatomic gas, then gamma for the polyatomic gas is given by 4 plus F vibrational by 3 plus F vibrational. For a polyatomic gas, it will have 3 translation degrees of freedom, 3 rotational degrees of freedom, and a certain number of vibrational degrees of freedom. So F vibrational is actually the number of vibrational modes present for a polyatomic gas. Okay, right. And the ninth point is only the average translational energy contribute to the temperature. So only the translational energy energy will contribute to the rise in temperature. Please do remember that. Okay. And now on the screen I have shown you different graphical representations also. And different cases also are mentioned and they are self-explanatory. So make sure you learn those graphical representations also. So I hope you have understood the chapter Kinetic Theory of Gases. Now, in case we have any doubts that you want me to address, you can comment below. Free feed to comment below. I'll get to get back to you as soon as possible. And in case you need me to discuss any chapters, do comment below. The next chapter will be thermodynamics. And after that, I'll be probably going with the electronics. Okay. And in case you need any chapters, any specific chapters or specific topics to be discussed, please do comment below. I'll be very happy to help you out. Okay. Okay then. Thank you.